Hello and welcome back to To Dada In Memoriam by Paulie Marshall. We finished the last video by looking at the narrator and Dada and we will continue looking at Dada now who is the grandmother of the narrator. She is a small and purposeful old woman. Purposeful means obviously full of purpose. She is focused and works hard. She has a painfully erect figure, which is maybe a little unusual for an old woman. And also unusual for an old woman was that she moved quickly at all times, which again show, shows how purposeful she was. She had a very unattractive face and there is a simile to describe this. But, uh, the narrator uses a simile to describe this. Her face was stark and fleshless as a death mask. Have a think about that simile and why the narrator has described her grandmother like that, comparing her to a death mask. However, her eyes were still alive with life. So even though her face looked like a death mask and she obviously looked old and um, like the 80 year old that she was, she was still full of life and this was shown in her eyes. This is also shown through her competitive spirit. She had a special relationship with the protagonist, which we have already discussed. Um, she also believes in stereotypes, thinking that white people are dominant. We can see this when she wishes that the narrator had lighter skin because she believes that she would find life easier if she had lighter skin. She also is scared and, and, and can't believe that the narrator had dared to have a fight with a white girl um, when she was in New York. Some language techniques used in this story. Clearly there are a lot of language techniques used because there always are in, in short stories, stories, novels, poems, etc. But one to focus on, I think, is the literary technique of contrasts. And Paulie Marshall uses contrast to compare the two different worlds of Dada and herself. She compares Barbados with New York. She compares herself with her grandmother. She compares nature with the city. She compares um, tradition and modernity. And the story charts a series of conversations between herself and her grandmother in which both characters try to assert the supremacy or the being better of their own home over the home of the other. So both try to prove that their home, either New York or Barbados, is better than the other. And they do this by showing off about what they have in their own homes, their own hometowns. For Dada, who has never left Barbados before and never will leave Barbados, her granddaughter shares the wonders of American city life that she can't even begin to imagine or understand. Remember, this is obviously way before the internet. So the grandmother, although she would have heard what it's like to live in America, what American city life is like, she never would have had the opportunity to discover for herself either physically or through the internet or probably even through books or newspapers what American city life is like and therefore it is completely unimaginable for her. The climax in this conflict of the difference between the two hometowns comes when Dada takes her granddaughter to see 
the tallest object which is on Barbados. And this quote here shows this. There, in a small clearing amid the dense bush, she stopped before an incredibly tall royal palm, which is a palm tree, which rose cleanly out of the ground and, drawing the eye up with it, soared high above the trees around it into the sky. It appeared to be touching the blue dome of sky, to be flaunting its dark crown of fronds right in the blinding white face of the late morning sun. So in this quote we can see that the grandmother, Dada, is very proud of this huge palm tree which is rising right up into the sky, much higher than the other trees around it. And she believes that it's the tallest thing that exists in the world. She can't possibly even imagine that there is anything taller than this. However, when Dada asks if there is anything taller than this wonderful example of creation, Polly Marshall is sad when she has to tell her about the skyscrapers in New York that rise even taller into the sky than this tree, one of which is the Empire State Building. When the grandmother hears this, first of all, she responds with anger and disbelief. She can't possibly believe that anything bigger exists, and she thinks that the narrator is lying. But then after a while, she accepts that in fact she has lost her home, her hometown, her home island has lost the competition to New York. And she returns her home with the narrator and the narrator is triumphant. She's happy she's won, yet she's also strangely saddened. She's not sure why she's saddened at the fact that she's won. She sees the eye, she sees the um, the life that had previously been in the eyes of her grandmother fade away. All the fight went out of her at that. The hand poised to strike me, so she, the grandmother was initially angry and she was about to hit the narrator. But then she accepted her defeat and her hand fell down to her side and she stared at me. Seeing not me, but the building, the Empire State Building, that was taller than the highest hill she knew, which was Bisex Hill. And the small, stubborn light in her eyes, which was the same amber as the flame in the kerosene lamp she lit at dusk, here we can see an example of the traditional life that she still leads. She still uses a kerosene lamp instead of electricity. The small stubborn light in her eyes began to fail. The life began to fade away. So the title of the story, To Da Da In Memoriam, we realize that this story is written as an homage to her grandmother. It's written later on in life with her looking back at the time that she met her grandmother and it's like she's writing it in memory of her. It's almost like she's writing a letter to her grandmother. And some quotes that you might like to make a note of. Perhaps she was both, both child and woman, darkness and light, past and present, life and death, all the opposites contained and reconciled in her. This is a quote about Dada, and it's showing the contrast within her. So she is like an old woman, but she's also still has some characteristics of a child. She's still excited, she's still happy about life, etc. She has both darkness and light inside her. She's living in the past still and 
this is an important idea actually the fact that she can't let go of the past and move fully into the present she has life still in her she's still energetic yet she's so close to death as well because of her age and another quote also about Dada, I know you don't have anything this nice where you come from. This is her showing off once again about Barbados. Oh the Lord, the world's changing up so I can scarce recognize it anymore. Again, this is showing that she is having difficulties um, moving on with the world as it is developing. She's scared of change. She's scared of um, becoming more modern. She's very happy living her traditional life with um, her kerosene lamps, her nature. And she's scared to hear about the electricity that the narrator talks about. She's scared to hear about all of the different machines that the narrator talks about. And she's also scared about the lorry that she has to travel on from the town or the city where she collects the family from to take them back home to St. Thomas. And this quote is quite clear. It is the narrator talking, explaining to Dada about the Empire State Building, which at that time was the tallest building in the world. And this is the one sentence which changes the whole story because it is the, it's the sentence which takes the life out of the grandmother's eyes and which, in, which eventually leads to her giving up on life and dying. I longed then for the familiar, for the street in Brooklyn where I lived, for my father who had refused to accompany us, for a game of tag under the chestnut tree outside our aging brownstone house. This is uh, the narrator talking when she is not comfortable in Barbados. She finds, she finds it scary at first um, and she just wants to be home where she feels safe, she knows what to expect, it's where her family is, where her dad is, um, and she wants to be back home with her friends, playing their normal games. Symbolism in the story. Obviously there's a, a very important symbol which is the Empire State Building. And it symbolizes power and progress and modernity. So in the midst, in the middle of the cold glass and steel of New York City is the Empire State Building. And therefore, it deforms Dada's symbol of power. The, <clears throat> um, the tall tree on Bisex Hill. Incorrect use of a semicolon there. Apologies. Um, it is not by accident that the knowledge of this building, the Empire State Building, shakes Studer's confidence. This is uh, an example of the conflict between both tradition and modernity, as well as um, rural and city life. So the steel and iron, the symbol of progress, is what shakes the nature-loving Dada. It can therefore be said that Dada's response to the knowledge of the Empire State Building is a foreshadowing of her death. Maybe this is because it is made of metal, just like the aeroplanes, that rattled her trees and flattened the young canes in her field and which eventually led to her death. And it's a physical echo of her emotional response to knowing that the Empire State Building exists. And the fact she's found dead after this incident is not really a surprise to the reader.